So welcome everybody to this uh, presentation or seminar on automated fact checking. My name is Eric Strom. I'm the leader of the area of advanced ICT at Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden. So why should we care about fake news? Why should we uh, be bothered by this? Well, it turns out that many of us rely on online media to get our information, and our information, of course, uh, shapes how we act and what we think and how society will evolve. So if we don't have the right information, we will probably not do the right choices. So topics of today's uh, uh, seminar is talking about fake news, detecting it, and then handling it. So if we detect the item as being fake news, what should we do? That's one question. Uh, we also know that misinformation is sticky. Um, false uh, beliefs can stick along for a long time, even though they are uh, debunked many, many times. Can we do something about making facts equally sticky? How to promote media literacy and evaluating information so of source, sources of information is, of course, crucial in, in the educational system. And what are the most effective strategies for debunking false information? Can fact-checking be made real-time, that is, being fast? And should this information, when it's uh, uh, detected, should it be removed? And who decides what to remove and what not? So today, uh, after my short introduction here, we will have two talks by invited speakers, and then a short break, and then a panel discussion before we conclude. So, and you can also follow us on social media. The area of advance, really short, is a cross-disciplinary initiative at Chalmers where we span many uh, um, departments in order to provide a smarter and safer society. Uh, our long vision goals is to uh, contribute to sustainability, both of developing tools which are sustainable and then using these tools to enable a sustainable transformation of society. There are many departments involved, we have many research centers, and we also work closely with the industry. Uh, now, going over to the speakers today, I would like to make a small advertisement for the Gate Institute, in particular for their uh, Big Data and AI Forum, which will be held on 8th to 9th of December, uh, and it will be online. Uh, so the Big Data um, for Smart Society Institute, GATE, is a first uh, center of excellence in Bulgaria working on integrating and extending scientific excellence and innovation in priority areas as Big Data, artificial intelligence, uh, at the regional and European levels. So future cities, intelligent government, smart industry, and digital health. So, it's uh, my honor to, and pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, Ivan Koychev. He's a full professor at the Faculty of Mathematics and Informatics at the University of Sofia. He has a PhD from the Bulgarian Academy of Science. Uh, after a postdoc at the German National, Insti uh, National Research Center for Information Technologies, and a research fellowship at the Smart Web Technology Centers at the Robert Gordon University in the UK. He's now back at the University of Sofia. He's a uh, leading expert on machine learning, natural language processing, information retrieval, and uh, data and text mining. Uh, so I'm really looking forward uh, to your talk, Ivan, and uh, if technology is with us, please uh, t um, take the floor. Thank you. For the floor, I will share my presentation now. Just a second. Okay. Uh, can you see it on the full screen already? Yes. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay. My talk is entitled today: "Looking for the truth in the post-truth era." Uh, I acknowledge uh, from my colleagues, students, and especially Preslav, to, I borrow some slides. Uh, okay, and also from the web, some things. You, I'm using it and trying to refer everywhere uh, where it's taken from. Uh, according to the 
task about uh, fake news uh, as a good software developer i first uh, I, I will try a bit to do business understanding and see what are the main concepts uh, okay first uh, we will look what is the fake news according to merriam webster dictionary it's kind of uh, self explainable not need to be to, to be defined because it uh, consists of uh, two well-known and easy to explain word, uh, words, uh, news and fake. Uh, everybody knows what is this. I will just want to add that usually the word news is associated with the truth. If it's not true, it's not the news, it's a lie. Okay. Um, of course, other uh, dictionaries try to give uh, kind of definition of the fake news uh, like a concept uh, but i will say it's more uh, focus on some features and how they are distributed that they are uh, have uh, wrong or lies inside one thing that i missed to say that uh, this is uh, okay actually this is term fake news isn't a new it's uh, maybe dated uh, century or a half ago it's uh, first um, it's appearing uh, somewhere in the news or in the literature okay also wikipedia um, have its uh, own definition of um, what is fake news okay it's a kind of uh, lie uh, I will say and it's how it's uh, distributed or half truth but it's difficult to define it and who is involved in this distribution okay mm, maybe it's more important that such words like uh, post truth era fake news are getting very kind of uh, in use recent years for example this post route is the word of the year 2016 of oxford dictionary the fake news is the word uh, of the year two uh, 2017 of the collins dictionary and it's uh, you see it's uh, increasing uh, popularity and usage okay what is the fake uh, a fake news maybe the one that i don't like it uh, uh, related term is disinformation. What is disinformation? Again, looking in the dictionary, it's false information usually. It's aiming to influence uh, public opinion or hide the truth. And it's uh, like first synonym, it's uh, related with propaganda. Uh, here, picture, uh, maybe you already saw it, uh, but it's quite popular. It's trying to say what is misinformation what is disinformation what is malinformation on the left uh, you see something that is false but uh, it's unintentional it's kind of ignorance uh, of the distributor of, of this uh, information on the right uh, you have uh, information that is uh, intent to harm it maybe can to be true, it can be false, but it's uh, important that it's uh, intent to harm. And this disinformation is somewhere overlapping uh, of both, kind of it can be false, uh, and usually it's false, and also it intend to harm. Here, there are uh, seven common form of information disorder. Mm, Okay, I will not go uh, in details uh, on this, but um, uh, it's mainly related to full context or ma manipulated, uh, misleading content, fabricated content, uh, satire, parado uh, parody, and so on. Okay, can uh, how fake news can be dangerous? Okay, you know this probably uh, famous story about uh, how the Brexit and the votes uh, and presidential election in the United States was manipulated 
from C Cambridge Analytics uh, by sending uh, very personalized uh, information on the bodies. It's um, behind this is this is uh, Cambridge Analytics. One of the main investors is uh, Robert Mercer. It's uh, scientists scientists in the area of uh, computer uh, of computational linguistic and natural language processing and he receives a life achievement award uh, in 2014 from this uh, acl uh, organization which is uh, the most re respectful scientific organization in area of natural language processing mm. But actually, I didn't. He didn't done any illegal. He just used uh, the state of the art technology to do this. Uh, the politicians uh, and uh, brands make uh, pay for it, like image maker, promotion, and uh, so on. Of course, uh, the web creator. Kim Berner Lee uh, worried that uh, Facebook weaponized uh, his invention. Uh, but in some way, as any one invention, uh, it can be weaponized. Like a knife you can use to prepare your dinner, salad, or whatever, and you can use um, to kill somebody. Of course, this is can influence uh, the stock market and here are some examples the fake news also can trigger some violence but uh, in some way the trigger is uh, kind of is not responsible for the violence usually the gun uh, if it's loaded it will shot uh, fire if it's not loaded it will not fire Okay, there is a interesting uh, publication how the lies uh, uh, create the illusion of truth, and it's referring to this um, citation that is um, attributed to Nazi minister of uh, propaganda uh, Joseph Goebbels. Repeating a lie often enough and it becomes the truth. Mm, and uh, such weapon uh, like illusion of truth uh, can be dangerous in such politicians and such people. Mm, actually, we are very much living uh, in a kind of virtual reality and it's uh, very easy this to be to, to happen. Uh, using only one media um, that will influence you. What are the roots of uh, fake news? Probably the loss of uh, confidence to the traditional media. Uh, if we look one step further, why it's happened this, probably the traditional media, media is quite uh, commercialized. Uh, low level of critical thinking and uh, news literacy maybe we should blame the education and look what's wrong do we teach our students to um, think critically uh, critically uh, shifting the business in business models okay there are for example click buys or other business models that are kind of making profit of uh, fake news, also malicious actors uh, like trolls and uh, other th that are sending uh, false reviews uh, to boost the uh, image of politicians or product and so on. Uh, we can summarize actually the motivation of uh, kind of producing fake news, money and power, they are quite related usually, maybe I don't say anything new. Uh, okay, we already say that uh, fake news are quite personalized already, because like all advertisement we receive uh, from the web are quite personalized because we are logging, we are even if we use a simple search engine, we have to log in there and they uh, and accept uh, some uh, 
licenses which uh, collect uh, and the information about us and uh, they know maybe our query before even we type it. Uh, and now there are some people that are do manual fact checking. Uh, here are kind of the landscape of uh, this uh, manual fact checkers and they are getting increasing the now it's about more than uh, 300 uh, active fact checkers. But actually, they didn't have a. Some of them are quite long time, maybe more than 10 years doing fact checking. Uh, but actually, from viewpoint of uh, training example for machine learning algorithms, they are not so much. Uh, this is, uh, and you see, maybe just three of them are more active, other are. Not so active. Uh, what the fact? Uh, uh, um, what do fact checkers uh, want? They want uh, to get uh, the most important claim. To know what is the most important claim to check. To know uh, whether somebody already checked, uh, uh, and to be able to check. Um, as possible, uh, as quick as possible. Here is the, I will say, the flow chart uh, of uh, how this uh, fact checking is going. Uh, first, uh, whether it's worthy to be checked, uh, then whether it's already checked, and uh, if it's not, uh, and uh, we try to check it, find the evidences um, for true or false for the fact. And how the computer scientists and uh, AI experts can uh, help uh, to the manual fact checkers. And I would like to underline that uh, most of people do trust, uh, okay, don't trust to fully automatic uh, fact checking. And we still, at least for even for fully automated fact checking, we do need training example to teach, uh, to train our models. Therefore, it's something important. Uh, these people doing great job, the manual fact checkers. Uh, what we can do for them, I try to summarize uh, the main task, identifying uh, check worthy claims, rank, the check worthy claims according to their importance, finding the pieces of evidences to support, deny the claims, and identifying already checked uh, claims. Um, you're free to add something uh, that I'm probably missing. Okay, the first task, uh, check worthiness estimation. What is worthy to check? Uh, I will just briefly introduce uh, one approach uh, that we done a few years ago. We collected uh, some data from presidential debate in 2016. Uh, there are nine fact checking organization which uh, kind of uh, done some fact checking. Uh, and we assume that uh, already pieces that are fact checked uh, are worthy to be checked. Uh, of course, we compare kind of uh, agreement between uh, different sources that I don't think there was a big uh, agreement, but it's uh, nothing wrong with it. We get about uh, 5,000, 50, 100 uh, claims uh, that it's worthy to be checked at the end. Okay, how we did approach, I will go very cool quickly uh, because Paolo will uh, probably present uh, something more fresh, uh, but I would like just to mark uh, the main features because in machine learning it's very important that 
this uh, feature engineering part, of course, with uh, today deep neural network, um, some people say, oh, it's feature engineering is not so important. Yes, probably, but uh, I think still, if we want to build explainable model, we still need, uh, even with uh, deep neural networks, we still need to do some feature engineering. Okay, we've done something on uh, the first group of features are on the sentence level, are more or less uh, standard features. As the time is going ahead, I will uh, probably not good idea to discuss one by one each of, the, of them. Maybe just a few. Name entity recognition is one of them. Uh, linguistics features maybe are more unusual. Mm, some bias, positive, negative. Here are the sample keywords that uh, are associated with these uh, linguistic features. Mm, context feature, position, size of the sentence, metadata, mm, metadata of reaction. Uh, for example, it's important the kind of the context. Uh, okay. One say something, the other uh, respond to the to this sentence, not in general. Uh, the con the context is uh, very important. Uh, also, we added some other, let me say, feature which are more related. Some statistical approaches. Uh, here are some deep neural network uh, work to vec discourse, contradiction, similarity, and uh, to previous. Mm, here is an example for contradiction. Again, the context is uh, very important. Uh, also, if it's uh, similar to something that is already checked, maybe it's uh, also worth to check it. And here we studied uh, how the features are, how important are the features for prediction. And here, a kind of list sorted according to the different measures. Uh, embeddings appears to be um, quite uh, important. Uh, here, we also study um, how it's important the context, and it appears that context adds significant uh, contribution to the uh, accuracy of prediction uh, in some way. And we are at that time compared with the state of the art and uh, we done it better. Automated fact checking. We also try to do some automated fact checking. Uh, we done uh, in this way, original claim. Mm, we generated a query, uh, look for best snippers and uh, the best web page uh, probably that uh, fit and try to label it uh, as true or false. Uh, we used some state of the art of the, that time um, networks. And actually, we managed to improve at least the baseline and accuracy. We got it. Um, it's about 80 percent and it's 80 percent when we combine the evidences from Bing, uh, Google, uh, and uh, going to the and taking the text from the web page. Sometimes it can be done very quickly using just the snippers. But the web page seems to be better. This is the, the results. Uh, OK, we can do also fact checking about uh, images. Uh, here is uh, an example. It's a false image and it's a false claim also. Uh, OK, the image, uh, the, the true image is uh, here without this type, put it in the hand uh, uh, of Putin. Actually, of course, we need some data and snoopers and uh, Reuters uh, have uh, such data set available that they uh, checked uh, some images and claims and label it uh, uh, about what is wrong. Here it's 
other examples and uh, we look uh, of the image whether it's manipulated uh, as much as possible we we also done a kind of uh, reverse image uh, search does the image appears in good and bad websites do the page support the claim that is uh, that we already having and uh, probably a good survey for multimodal disinformation detection is this one. Uh, and okay, actually, fact checking approaches can be um, classified in two main uh, uh, streams. First is explainable and non-explainable. Uh, the explainable one is uh, in some way preferable because uh, it can easily be explained for uh, to the user the non explainable in some way maybe can be more accurate but uh, the problem with the explanation uh, is a real one uh, but in this case recently in the area of ai is very much effort spent to explainable AI. And I believe that some combination maybe of both approaches uh, can help. Usually it's kind of uh, combination of these approaches that are listed here. Uh, in help of uh, manual fact checkers, they are check data competition it's kind of scientific competition uh, organized uh, each year, even ne next year there will be one uh, from 2008. Uh, usually um, it's like data set, there are political debates uh, uh, and they are checked uh, using different tasks for different languages. The last year, it's mainly oriented to Twitter. I think uh, here even we have uh, such a um, category like partially true, uh, whatever it means. Okay. Uh, as we mentioned, there are some manipulative users that are trying to manipulate um, public opinion or usually they paid. They have different names with different tricks. Uh, I will not go in details uh, to all this uh, uh, kind of uh, let me say trolls on paid users, including there is a automatic uh, or social bots that, uh, of course, they do have uh, agenda to follow these bots. They're not just uh, disturbing the users. They um, do some propaganda, advertisement, or whatever. Uh, some marketing techniques that are um, used also and. In all this case, there is somebody who pay this user uh, to do some manipulation, uh, promote something, uh, usually spread uh, some lies. Here seminar users, uh, also another, uh, usually by political parties uh, for propaganda. Uh, and of course, from marketing as well, also well-known techniques. Okay. Uh, we've done some, and I will share some of our experience about uh, how to deal with uh, these uh, trolls, which are usually motivated by uh, money. Actually, they are a problem not only for the communities uh, like uh, news or something like this, uh, but also uh, for Wikipedia, uh, politicians also use it. Uh, uh, also for fake reviews to promote product, uh, 
or putting down the competition, all these things are on the way. Of course, uh, people raised uh, awareness of it and they need uh, kind of tools that can help them to deal with uh, such trolls. Okay, can we find our trolls automatically? Uh, probably, yes, if we have training data. Actually, we managed to collect some training data. There was a Bulgarian case with protest, and actually there were able some leaking information finally to find uh, maybe uh, real trolls, and we managed to find what are their messages, uh, what did they write it, how they behave and we collected uh, you see from some comments uh, in the news from Facebook community forums actually we managed to collect data uh, from real trolls we also collected many uh, other data from forums okay and from this uh, data from the forums we assume that for example uh, the people that are called trolls or some synonym of trolls by many people. Uh, and finally, uh, we assume that, uh, okay, users that are uh, called, uh, let me say, five or ten times by other user, uh, by other users uh, that are that troll, that are kind of accused troll or mentioned trolls. Um, we have pay troll, we have non trolls, and we uh, train some. Okay, we also done some feature engineering according to our observation. Uh, what will help to accuse the trolls? For example, they do work uh, like normal working hours and uh, and uh, many other features, and we manage to. Kind of uh, make a classifier. I will just go directly if, to the results. In summary, uh, we managed to build a classifier using these uh, accused trolls uh, and tested it on the real trolls, and it's uh, um, achieved more than 90% accuracy. And also, we managed to also find the troll comments. Again, this is one tested on true accused uh, on true trolls, but it was trained on uh, accused trolls because in uh, in general we don't know who are the trolls. This is just an exception uh, that we can uh, find uh, such data. Uh, okay, what is propaganda? As you remember, we say that it's uh, quite a synonym of disinformation. Yes, it is used to influence uh, audience. Uh, maybe use select, uh, may use lies, also selective presentation of facts using loaded language, uh, proceed to emotion, and who is involved in this? Of course, almost everybody. Uh, okay. Conclusions? Uh, actually, uh, what I want, I would like to say, the Fake news are politicized, commercialized, weaponized, can be personalized, employ disinformation techniques. Uh, technology can raise awareness, uh, warn the user, help the human fact checkers, but we should be careful, support freedom of speech, uh, preserve the diversity of ideas and opinions. Thank you for your attention. So thank you so much, Ivan. Uh, that was uh, quite an extensive uh, um, 
uh, piece of uh, uh, presentation. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion in the panel debate a little bit later. Uh, so we would now move on to the next speaker in order to keep time a little bit. And uh, um, our next speaker is from Eurocom, which is a graduate school and research center yes. in digital science uh, at, uh, in the southern part of France. A uh, very nice area. I recommend it highly for a visit, uh, not only for the nice beaches, but also for the high quality research uh, and teaching which is done here. So it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, which is Paolo Papotti, and he's an associate pre professor then at Eurocom. He has a PhD degree from uh, Roma Tre University in, in Italy and had held a research position in the Qatar Computing Research Institute and Arizona State University. He's an expert on data integration and information quality, uh, a prolific author with uh, several awards and also uh, taking part in the scientific community as associate editor and so forth. So without uh, any further ado, uh, thank you very much for joining us today, Paolo, and the floor is yours. All right, good morning, everybody. Thanks for this opportunity. I'm glad to visit uh, Chalmers, even if virtually for the first time. So I will go straight to my talk and uh, I'm gonna tell you something about our work on uh, computational fact checking. And uh, given the very good introduction done by Ivan, I'm gonna be very fast on the motivation for this work we have seen misinformation happening for several years on social networks now, and Ivan gave good examples of the impact they have on society. And uh, I've been working on this topic for some time, but of course it became very popular about two years ago. As we all know, during this pandemic, one of the big problems is also the massive amount of uh, information that is hard to trust and we are not sure what is the correct or incorrect information. Since the beginning, the World Health Organization said that one of the priorities was to provide accurate information to fight the infodemic. And that this is something that is happening mostly online. And of course, the big tech companies, the big players are doing something to limit this problem. And for example, if you Google uh, one claim that it's incorrect, Google will try to match this against the database and uh, say, oh, look, someone already checked this and uh, we know that it is false. So be careful, uh, you know, you can click this link and find why scientists say that it's false. On uh, Facebook, uh, if, you, if someone tries to share a story that is known to be false, there's gonna be a pop-up saying, be careful before putting this story in, in your feed, maybe you want to check additional uh, reporting. And finally, it is the first tweet that has been labeled by Twitter when uh, they added a label to say, be careful about this content, you may want to check the facts about this topic. So this is something that is happening. And uh, as also Eva mentioned, there are groups of people doing this manual work of fact checking. All these services that I've been showing, they rely on some people, some journalists, on some expert, sitting down, checking the news and writing a report to say that something is true or false. There are 300 groups doing this around the world. Those are amazing people doing a very important job, but it's a limited number of people that have the uh, challenge of verifying every day all the content that is shared on the internet. And of course, there is a problem because the, this manual fact checking cannot scale to the amount of information that is produced every day online. You don't have to take my word for this. There are plenty of evidence that there is a problem with the amount of information. For example, this is from May last year, saying that even Facebook that has a partnership with all the fact-checking organizations and they have an army of 30,000 human moderators for content, they, are, they were struggling with the amount of false claims about coronavirus. They, they've been maxed out. There are studies showing that where false content starts to spread online, it takes up to 22 days to downgrade or remove it from the platform. And we're talking about English. For other languages, such as Italian and Spanish, sometimes it stays forever. So there is a challenge here that uh, the general problem is that given some content, we would like to be able to assess if it is true or false. And uh, what we try to build are the tools 
that support the people that uh, uh, help the moderators to rank, to filter out the content that is more suspicious, so that this problem can be tackled in a much faster way. So our focus today, uh, the, the, the work I'm going to discuss a bit, it's about how to recognize that some content, textual content, it's true or false, given some reference data, some reference information, and uh, trying to explain why we believe it is true or false. So we focus on uh, methods that try to be explainable. And here we're talking about uh, content claims that are fresh, unseen. So it's the first time that they are shared or they are said by a politician. So this is different from the works that try to do matching against the existing uh, checks. Okay, like the service we saw on Google. So again, I want to emphasize that those are computational methods, so we want them to be effective, they should be accurate, scalable, automatic at scale, they can check thousands of claims per minute, and they should be interpretable, they should be able to explain why. I think that is very important because every time we say that something we believe is false or true, we want to show also the facts. There is something that is done also by Google, it's done by Facebook, it's done by Twitter, of course, if you want to help someone understand what's going on, you need to, to provide an explanation for the decision. So getting a bit more precise, uh, what we're trying to build is a function that given a textual claim and some reference uh, information, some data, returns a true-false label, a measure of the confidence of this decision, and a description of the subset of the data that implies the decision. Okay, so I'm going to show you two stories very quickly uh, about two different kinds of claims that we have studied. The first one is about property claim. So here is an example of a property claim. It is a simple sentence stating that Elon Musk is the founder of Chevrolet. So by using any system uh, that goes online and tries to answer this, you will get that this is false. But what our system does in this case is that it tells us that it is false because Chevrolet was founded in 1911 and Elon Musk was born in 1971. So we think that this is important because, uh, as I mentioned, many methods by looking online can tell you that this is false by using a classifier, but we argue that it's important to try to generate these logical explanations, these logical arguments that, as you can see, they show that they understand the concept of a person, company, birth year, founding year, and the fact that you cannot found a company if you were born after that year, okay, the founding year. So this is something that we published a couple of years ago, and um, it's a, a system which we, we call XClaim, that given an input claim C, which is the sentence, it transforms it into a triple, uh, that is a predicate with a subject and an object, and then uh, this is used together with evidence coming from uh, a knowledge graph, which is basically a graph database, and uh, the web. We use these uh, differences, and then we say, okay, we believe that it is true or false uh, with a certain probability and with uh, an explanation. So, the, of course, the magic here is in providing these explanations that are semantically meaningful, okay? And our secret here is that we are very good at mining rules from uh, this graph. This graph is very rich semantically. It's a knowledge graph, knowledge base. And uh, with a real discovery algorithm, we get rules like the one below. I will read it for you. So it is a, a, a logical rule that it's, uh, it has a support of 0 0.1, so it's a rule that is very likely to be correct. And it's saying that every time you have someone declared to be a founder, if the birth year of this person is bigger than the founding year of that company, there is a contradiction. Okay, so we mine uh, thousands and thousands of views from the knowledge graph to cover all the different predicates. And uh, we put them online in this corpus. There are 20,000 views there. And basically what happens is that when there is a fact, such as founder Elon Musk Chevrolet, this gets instantiated over the rule. We collect the other fact coming from the knowledge base on from the web, and we say, okay, this rule is triggered. It's, it, it's uh, activated. So there is a contradiction. 
Okay. Unfortunately, there are very few rules that are so clear and with strong evidence. Sometimes we have rules that are more uncertain. For example, if two people uh, have a child in common, they are married. This is true with 50-60% uh, support in the knowledge graph, right? So we know that life is not black and white. And so that's why in our system we have also a probabilistic reasoner that takes together multiple rules and basically put the evidence together and decides if something is more likely to be negative, false, or more likely to be true. So we did uh, a lot of experiments, of course, uh, to compare these against baselines, and I'm not going into the numbers. What I want to mention is that our system is the only that can explain with the, with the evidence. So in this case, for example, it's saying uh, that uh, this guy, Michael White, cannot get, it's, it is not correct that he got his alma mater from a certain university because is working for that university, and it's unlikely in the US that you work in the place where you graduated. And also, he already has two places listed as his alma mater. So it's unlikely that you have a lot of alma mater, more than one or two. So all of this together, the, it's the evidence that leads to the false conclusion. Uh, so this was an example for property claims. And uh, we also have uh, another instance of this function for statistical claims. So let me give you an example. This is a tweet from uh, March uh, 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic. And this lady was arguing that the death rate was 1.3% in the US. So this was an argument to say that we should not worry about uh, COVID, etc., etc. So we built a, a system that uh, takes these statistical claims as input in English and in many other languages. And it basically says that uh, those are uh, false, uh, the 1.3% claim for the death rate in the US. And it explains that uh, we believe that is false because we found from the official data uh, that uh, there is a query saying that the value is more likely to be 2.8 for the US in March, given the reported number of total deaths and the reported number of uh, total confirmed case. So we, we understand that there is a ratio, we understand that those are the tables, the cells, the attributes, and we can conclude that we believe that is false. So this has been uh, online since uh, uh, 18 months now, or even more, and um, we have uh, more than 20,000 claims that have been checked by more than 50,000 people. And uh, it has been adopted by two fact-checking organizations uh, with by using our API in their checking pipeline. And the way that this works is that we are exploiting uh, um, the power of NLP, specifically transformers, and query generation over the data. So for example, here, given the claim, US debt rate is 1.3% in March. First, we will check if it is a statistical claim. If it is the case, we try to extract numbers. And then we try to interpret the sentence by using uh, classifiers on top of a transformer. Those are being trained with fine tuning with examples that we generated from the data. These classifiers are basically telling us, okay, given this sentence, I believe that you need to look up these tables, these relations, you need these attributes, you need to look at these tuples, you need to, to use these formulas. Okay? And of course, it is not precise 100%. So what we do is that we take the top K, for example, the top two, the top three predictions, and we combine them in an algorithm to create all the possible queries that we run over the data about COVID. Of course, here we're assuming that we trust this data. Okay, And we can debate about this. But we assume that the data is reliable, or at least that's the best data we have. So given this data, we try to find if there is at least one query that, given D, will satisfy the claim. In this case, it's this number, right? If they, we have this query, then we say that it's true. Otherwise, we explain why we believe it's false. And of course, many things can go wrong. Uh, I give a couple of examples. Uh, yesterday, the number of new cases in France decreased a lot. So our tool will understand that this is in a certain time interval. Uh, you need a new confirmed table, we're talking about France, we need this formula, but we don't know what is the meaning of a lot in this context. So another example is in Europe, the number of new cases is decreasing this month. We know 
everything except that Eureka, Europe is not a tuple in our database. It's not a, an entry. We have Italy, France, Germany. So we need to do an aggregation here, but we don't know this concept yet. So what we do is that when we have these cases that are not covered yet, we let the user annotate. And with their feedback, we create new training examples so that the system learns over time how to handle uh, more, more kinds of claims. So this is a system that we developed uh, in collaboration with uh, Cornell, with some support from Google, and uh, we published last year. It's a, a bigger system. I just described the first part. What we do is that we also enable to verify a large number of claims by using a group of people but this is not important for this talk. What I want to report from this paper is that we did a user study with the fact checkers. Basically, we gave them this tool to some of them, and uh, for some others, we let them use the usual tools that they were using. And uh, we were able to show that uh, given a, a large number of uh, claims and 20 minutes to verify them, the people doing the manual process were able to verify about half of the claims that, of the people using our tool. So here I want to stress that we are not trying to say that everything should be done completely automatically. Okay, Ivan already made this point and I completely agree. What we're trying to do is to help them, but indeed we can show experimentally that even with claims with high complexity, our the system is able to reduce the verification time effectively. Okay, we have a higher complexity because we can have also very complex formulas in the verification of statistical claims. So this concludes the first part of my talk. I want to spend a few more minutes because I want to talk a, a little bit about the bigger picture. Okay, so I give you some feeling of the methods that we are developing in many groups. There is this uh, uh, big survey that uh, we wrote about uh, collaborating with the fact checkers about their needs and uh, the tools that they're adopting. So there is a bit of hope that slowly these tools, they're moving from the labs to the users, to the end users being uh, journalists or NGOs or people who are willing to understand more. Now, despite this positive note, I have to say that there is, no, there is not too much to be optimistic here. And the reason is that the problem, it's very, very hard because it's a societal problem where the humans play a big role. And humans can be tricky. For example, you may remember from the beginning, I was telling you that Facebook raised this pop-up when you are trying to share something that is known to be false. And this is a screenshot from someone saying, you know, Facebook, leave me alone, uh, this is pathetic, do you really think I'm going to trust your stupid pop-up after my years of research on vaccines? So, another guy, thank you Facebook for being so concerned, give me a break, you really think I'm going to trust you. And then my favorite, this is very recent, someone saying, uh, are you tired of this boring uh, fact checkers uh, stopping your uh, true? the truth online so you can block them. I keep blocking them. It is a way around censorship, spread the knowledge. So big problem, right? I mean, uh, we, we are trying hard, but there is a, a challenge because we have also human behavior and many, many other aspects, right? So I, I, I would like to conclude my talk with an analogy that I like to make between this big societal problem and another problem that we had that was killing people and causing disasters for a long time. And somehow we are getting better at managing that problem. And it is the problem of death with uh, car accidents. Okay, so there is a plot with a lot of lines, but I would like you to focus for a moment on the red line. This is the number of deaths per billion traveled miles, okay? So over time, the number of uh, miles traveled increases a lot, of course, yeah, we're talking about tens of billions, but the number of deaths per traveled miles is going down consistently over time. We have been able to reduce it by orders of magnitude across the last hundred years. So why I like to, to report this? Because in order to have this achievement, there have been, of course, a lot of intervention taken by different actors. And one actor, it's indeed the tech, 
the, the, the technology. In 1978, they introduced the ABS. Even earlier, they introduced the safety belt in 1961. And those are two examples among the many ways that we have for active and passive protection of people in the car. But it is only one angle of the problem and, and one way to solve it. If we look at how we manage to reduce the number of deaths, it's also very important to look at the regulation. There is a lot of regulation that has been written over these hundred years, and it took us time to understand how to regulate this sector. Uh, in 1984, the seat belt became mandatory in many states in the US. Remember, it was created in 1961. So it took years before we understood that it was mandatory, it was important to be mandatory to make people use the seat belt. And, and if you go online, there are a lot of videos of people complaining about this in 1984 because it was violating their freedom. You can compare this with the other problems that we have nowadays. This is the first driving license to allow people to drive. This is from 1888. And this became uh, uh, mandatory only 20 years after, in 1909. So I think that uh, the analogy here is start to become clear. There are many actors that were and actions that were involved in order to reduce the car deaths. There is the technology in the factory, ABS, airbag, etc. But also there are the regulators with laws and the uh, judges, and there are the local politicians making sure that the infrastructure is in good shape and local agents. So we have these big ecosystems and it took us a lot of time to understand who is doing what and how to do it properly. When we move to the Howard problem through how to reduce misinformation, I think that my presentation today was trying to give you an example that for this part, for the bottom left, we don't have the factor involved, but we have code. And this code is creating the airbag of misinformation, computational fact checking. There is one technical solution that is taking care of the tech aspect, but we don't have still very clear answer about the responsibilities and the roles for the other uh, aspect of the problem. Very recently, we finally start to have some regulation in the European Union with the Digital Service Act. There are some analogies also in the UK and in other states, but that's only a first step. We still don't have clear rules, and in a way, we are trying to fix in a very short amount of time a big problem that probably will require times to understand exactly who is in charge of what, what are the good rules to set up. So to conclude, um, I give you some uh, vision over what is going on in terms of uh, data-driven fact-checking, as also Ivan was giving for many other technical tools that are not the airbag, maybe it's working on the airbag and the ABS and other pieces, right? And of course, we need more tech. In my group, we are working on how to handle ambiguity in the claim. For example, if you go to Corona Check, our system now, you will see that for a claim, we give multiple interpretation because sometimes the claim is ambiguous. So if you mean this claim today is true, but if you mean this claim with respect to this month, maybe it's false. And then we try to synthesize better explanation with uh, English and other languages. So this is about the technology. We need more, and I believe that a lot of people are pushing the technology. But it's not only about the technology. We need to be aware that it's important that we speak to our colleagues and uh, to the society about uh, the changes we need in the regulation and the push we need in the education in order to make everybody aware of this problem and to be prepared to handle them. So I will conclude here. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to the discussion in the panel. So thank you very much there, Paolo. And thank you also, Ivan, for putting this uh, important topic in context, which is now uh, should be clear that this is not purely a technological problem, of course, but it involves uh, uh, humans in a large degree, regulation, and so forth. And now it's time for the panelists, so I will hand over uh, the mic and floor to my colleague uh, Graham Kemp, please. Thank you, Eric. So I'm pleased that we still have with us Ivan and Paolo, and we're also joined on stage by our colleagues, uh, first of all, closest to me, Sheila Galt, who's a retired professor 
of Applied Electromagnetics at Chalmers. She's also very engaged with the Swedish Skeptics Association, and we'll hear more about that uh, today. Next is Jenny Vick, who's a researcher and project leader at Media and Democracy at Lindholm and Science Park. And she's looking into, for example, the automation of journalism. And also Bengt Johansson, who is a professor in journalism at the University of Gothenburg, with a strong focus on the field of media power, uh, of media power and democracy. So, uh, with that, I'd like to um, ask uh, perhaps Jenny first of all. Um, you're working at the Media and Democracy uh, Organisation at Lindholm. Can you tell me a bit more about that organisation and your work there? Sure. Um, yeah, um, Media and Democracy is a um, national innovation platform for media houses where they pool resources uh, to create uh, advancement in technological and uh, journalistic methods areas together. And um, I'm usually at um, uh, the same place as Bing, the Department of Journalism, Media and Communication here at University of Gothenburg. But now I'm affiliated to um, the Media and Democracy platform and actually also the platform AI Sweden, which is about advancing AI technology, doing research project on um, the uh, development and applications of AI in journalism and newsrooms. And there's a lot of those, and fact-checking is, of course, one opportunity there. Yeah, thanks. And, um Event. you've been carrying out research on uh, crisis communication and societal trust. Can you tell me something about your yeah. research? Yeah, I'm actually involved in, I think, four different projects on COVID-19 and uh, crisis communication. <laughs> uh, and uh, I mainly focus on the mechanism of trust related to people's adaption of protective measures and also understanding uh, COVID-19 messages from authorities and so on. Uh, that's one of the branches I'm into, but also into political communication. We're doing a study right now on people's, uh, if they trust the electoral process, and what are the drivers of that in terms of alternative media use. It's a huge impact, but also social uh, demographic aspects. But uh, it seems like when we talk about misinformation and disinformation and so on, alternative media use has a huge impact on it if you believe the electoral process is, is fair. So that's part of what I'm doing, so I'm really into this. I'm not into computer linguistics and so on, but I'm really into the question of uh, fake news or misinformation, disinformation. Thanks. And uh, Sheila, you've been working with the uh, Skeptics Association. You also, three years ago, organized uh, a workshop on fake news, gimmicks, and pseudoscience. Can you say mm -hmm. something about the thinking behind the title of that event and what, what what you're doing with the uh, Skeptics Association. Yeah, uh, the workshop that you're talking about that we had at Chalmers, it was with the Sustainability Day, and I was uh, trying to uh, get students and co-workers to wake up and find out what's, uh, uh, what's the relevance for us at a university with the talking about these sort of aspects. Uh, and we were looking into what can we do about it and how can we find what is uh, pseudoscience, possibly even happening within our walls. Uh, it's uh, one of my things that I've been uh, doing on my free time a lot is looking at how can we educate the public and um, students um, and also uh, looking at uh, helping teachers to teach better. And how can we put the tools into the next generation to avoid the types of uh, troubles that we're seeing at the moment with fake news and so on. And the, this uh, Skeptics Association is uh, just a, a non-profit organization with a huge number of resources available online. 
as well mm -hmm. with links to the uh, the English version of it with the skeptics organization based in the United States. United States, so I, I suggest that anybody looking for tools can take and check that. Thanks. So we heard in the early part of today's session the technical possibilities for fact-checking, but what happens next? After the fact-checker has done its job, what do we then do with the results that we obtain from that? And I throw that out to uh, anyone, uh, perhaps Paolo or Ivan, do you have any first comments on this? Briefly, we can train our models uh, with uh, such data, helping to improve uh, the models uh, that we can uh, also, for the task that I've uh, mentioned during my presentation about what is worth to check, uh, what is more important, uh, no, all these things uh, to be done, they need uh, usually uh, training data and uh, this kind of uh, mutual help each other. Then we can help with uh, these systems uh, to do the job better and quicker uh, to the fact checkers. Another comment, if I may, is that uh, indeed uh, the production of the outcome of the fact checking is something that we are trying to achieve with the evidence and all the arguments we discussed. But there are still a lot of open challenges on what is the right way to deliver the fact check, how to reach out to many people and how to be insightful and useful to people, not to be dismissed easily. Right, so this is a very important problem, uh, and uh, uh, we are testing different way to be creative in the way that we deliver the, uh, the verification of the fact. So one of the ways that the results of fact checking can be used is for well, it was shown in your presentations. It can be used to tag or to mark items as potentially uh, false. Uh, is that the right way to, or the best way to? deal with this? Should the, is tagging enough? Should misinformation be removed? Uh, how would you recommend that we should be handling the, uh, the hits that the methods are finding? To me, I will uh, forward uh, this question to the social science uh, colleagues. Uh, I don't want to take the site uh, and just developing the algorithms to highlight what is important, what is probably wrong uh, or false. Uh, David, I will keep silent uh, on this question. So if we're passing the question to the social scientists, can I ask uh, Jenny or Bent for your thoughts on this? Well, yeah, from, I mean, there's some issue of uh, freedom of speech <laughs> when you talk about automatically removing information as part of the process. I mean, I think, um, as, as uh, the speaker says, from, I mean, from a journalistic perspective, this is a great resource to the fact checkers. I mean, that can speed up the process and, and support it in many ways. And, uh, but if you sort of uh, remove the human fact checker from the process, which is being done in social media, for instance, um, then it's a kind of different thing, because then we need to discuss uh, where do we draw the line for what information should be free and which should not, and do we sort of condemn false information from the public, mm -hmm. or should we let that through, uh, and I mean, as uh, Paolo mentioned in the end, this is a very difficult question because maybe people are resistant to <laughs> the truth. Mm. But I think uh, it's a very important question um, that to what extent do we automate the different parts of this chain, so to say? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I agree. It's a, it's a tricky question to remove things automatically because uh, then we don't know actually uh, what's out there and someone also decides what we shouldn't see at all and um, th that, that is a freedom of speech question. Uh, I much more prefer that you actually get a warning say this is, might be problems with this information, it might be false and so on, uh, but uh, removing stuff 
not really my cup of tea. So fact checkers, uh, automatic fact checkers could be used by human fact checkers as a, a, a tool to support them in their work. Do you think that there are any others who should be using this technology or who might like to use this technology? Uh, Paolo, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I have a, a quick comment on this. So it happened to me last year when we started the Corona Check that uh, our effort was uh, featured by a website and a YouTube channel of people who are in one of these bubbles where they, you know, they were denying everything, basically. And uh, it was interesting to see that uh, uh, some of these people were using uh, the tool. And uh, I think that there is a large number of uh, people who are willing to understand better what's going on. You know, I, I, want, I, I, I don't dare to say what is true, right? But there is a lot of uh, civic engagement, both in the people who are very skeptical, but also in the people who are, you know, just willing to understand better what's going on. So uh, what we try to do with this leader website is also to make it accessible to everybody. And the response was interesting in the sense that there is a public for this. Of course, our is a little bit exercise from a university, but uh, I think that uh, it's important to cultivate and to encourage people to be active in understanding. I know that it's tiring and it's, it's, and it's not as easy as an headline saying, you know, this is, it's all to blame on the Illuminati or, you know, or any bad guy out there. It's difficult, but it's important to create the tools, create the educational material in order to expose people who are willing uh, to learn and then we can uh, we could also open a discussion on uh, not forcing but you know strongly encouraging people to learn about this starting from a young age but also for adults to learn what is uh, uh, a verification why we should not trust such source, some, some sources how to be critical so i think that fact checkers of course it's the easy target but we should be more ambitious and trying to make tools that can be used by a wider audience. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the fact checkers it should also be an asset for uh, ordinary citizens like us. And uh, there are different layers when dealing with trying to debunk disinformation. First, you have regulations, so then you have, of course, big tech companies and their ethical values, and then you have fact checkers, and then you have online engagement as well. Uh, as ordinary citizens participating in these discussions, and they could use these resources, have them as an asset for uh, having a good, good argument for it, to counter-argue false information or for fake news or disinformation, saying, yeah, look here, this is actually where the facts are, and this is the facts. So uh, the, the fact-checkers could also be an asset for ordinary citizens in, the, in very important online engagement, because mm -hmm. We all know those who don't trust government and don't trust institutions, they might trust f the fellow citizen, the ordinary man. So that might be easier to convince someone that is on the same level as you are, not talking to you from above. Any I just want to add please. one little thing there. Yes. Um, just a, a note of thinking for yourself. What makes you, yourself, listen and use that? Uh, that, that is uh, embroidered more in the debunking handbook that you can find online. Yes. So in regarding debunking, what are the best strategies to take there for uh, correcting uh, misconceptions? I'm not the expert, but what I, what I do believe is that you need to sandwich the feelings between the two layers of bread, which are facts. So start with a fact and then address what the feelings are of the person that you're speaking to or writing to and end up with a fact. But always think about what's in it for you. Hmm. I heard a remark in your talk, Ivan, about um, a knife, that it could either be a tool or it could be weaponized. And the same with news. It can be a positive thing, also weaponized. What about things like fact-checking technology itself? Is that something that you see as good, or could there be possible ways in which that technology might be misused if in the wrong hands? 
My personal opinion that is everything can be used uh, in the wrong uh, way. Uh, everything depends who is behind it, who is behind the knife, uh, given this example. Yes. Of course, the, the technology is not good or bad. If not, the knife is there. It can be used uh, for very, very useful and uh, nice things. And uh, yeah, ben, so, could you I add saw on this? something online a couple of days ago about a fa fact checker connected to climate skeptics. So uh, they they twisting it around and saying that uh, yeah this is also a fact checker but it's a false fact checker so uh, it's not just a fact it's also the fact checkers so it's not about just trusting the information it's also trusting those who are sending the information so it's um, like you said it's, it's a weapon it can be used for good and for bad and uh, it all boils down to who we actually trust. I mean, um, scraping social media for opinions and, and claim, these kind of claims always connected to ethical considerations, I think. I mean, for this, uh, for creating facts and, and, and sort of drawing attention to facts is a, a good reason, but still uh, involving the kind of opinion data, I think, which people publish for themselves in debates, or they don't really count for anyone collecting it <laughs> like this and clustering it. I think uh, there's always um, very important that we sort of think every step through uh, and what it means by collecting data in the first place. And of course, this, that, that kind of technology could also be dangerous when we cluster opinion data in, in um, perhaps a regime which is not very friendly to uh, the population, for instance. Uh, the examples that you showed, you were working with some data sets which had been gathered, often historical data. You worked with the data two, three years old and would uh, train and test to evaluate the quality of the models being built. What about the prospects for fact-checking in real time? Is the technology that's currently being developed in this field suitable for real-time fact-checking, or would new developments be needed in order to uh, provide response times that might be needed in certain situations? Do you mean uh, fully automated uh, fact-checker, fact-checking, or helping um, fact-checkers to to do the, the job? I was thinking helping fact checkers, but in real time. So if there was a live debate, would we yes, be able live, to check? Yeah. Yes, in case of in live debate, probably the most useful things that can be done is uh, just to search for uh, whether this fact is already checked. Uh -huh. This is uh, and. Uh, the other things uh, are difficult with uh, low ac accuracy, and uh, I don't see it uh, at the moment. Of course, you can run, say, okay, this is nice to be checked, uh, but if it's uh, uh, also, you can provide uh, evidences uh, for uh, the fact checkers, but anyway, the fact checker, till he check it and read it, uh, it will take a lot a lot of time. I think it's for quick uh, life uh, debate. Uh, I don't see it will work, probably. Any other thoughts on real-time fact-checking? Is this something that there would be a demand for? Yes, I yeah, definitely would like that uh, during debates, uh, during the election campaigns, when the politicians say something and the interviewer might not be so uh, have the knowledge about what what you said, but if they had a, could have some sort of fact checker and say, well, what you just said is actually not true, and people are never never want to lose their face in public, right? Yes, we want, don't want to do that. So if you could actually have this kind of fact checking in in in, uh, in real time, that would probably make politicians less keen on lying in public. Hopefully, yes. That's a nice aspiration. That's a good. 
What about having a fact checking before you're allowed to press enter? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that on social media, I would love people have this kind of the, you know, sometimes you, you have this kind of, do you really want to post this? Yes. And I actually had one of the editors for a journal, is yes, you, you get it back five minutes later. Are you really sure you want to submit this article now? <laughs> yes. uh, and I think that you see time lag, because I think that's one of the problems you, you, are, you are mentioning, is that it goes too fast. Mm -hmm. Uh, you need to think and consider, do you actually want to post this? And I sometimes write tweets or post on Facebook. And then I let it lie for a couple of minutes. And, do I really want to post this? Nah. nah. I just want to write it, but I don't need to post it, <laughs> right? Jenny, yes. I think uh, it's an interesting aspect with the time, actually, because we have sort of become used to a logic of correction afterwards. I mean... Uh, in, in social media and in journalism, it's very much about being the first to say something. And, and, and then if it's not correct, we can always... Uh, I mean, it, it was difficult to correct a printed newspaper, but now we can actually go back. Mm. But uh, it's, it's a problem anyway, because uh, as was mentioned in the presentation, if people have heard this uh, truth... <laughs> which is false, uh, it can be very difficult to change the perception of this in, in, afterwards. Yes, indeed. Yes, the, the misinformation can be sticky. It can stick right. very much. Yeah. Um, should we, could we do more to make facts more sticky, to try and uh, fight back against uh, false information? Facts uh, are fun. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's one of the problems, you know, that uh, conspiracy theories and, and these kind of things are engaging. You know? Yes. It, it, it's, uh, it's puzzling, it's uh, something that is hidden behind, and, and it, it's intriguing in many ways. So the key question, the key problem is, is to how make the facts being that engaging as the, the false information or conspiracy theories are, and if I had the clue what to do there, I would probably travel around the world giving <laughs> lectures about that. <laughs> Very good. I can comment on this. That, uh, indeed, uh, we have an ongoing project where we have this uh, study showing that, you know, most of the misinformation is very compact or it's uh, communicated with visual, with memes, and because the kind of information that they deliver is in, mo in most cases very simple and uh, not very detailed, right? Well, when you do a fact check, you need to cover all the aspects in order to make sure that you, you can state that something is true or false, especially when it's false. And if you look at the claim reviews, which are these fact checks that are shared online, there is a big number. I think that also Ivan mentioned this. There is a large number of uh, fact check reports that are online and available. They are long, like paragraph and paragraphs long. So we are looking at methods to make them uh, short. Uh, like a sentence or two, or how to generate automatically visual ads, or how to generate automatically memes. But it's it's very, very hard, right? I mean, uh, but I, I, from what you guys are saying, it seems that it's uh, a promising uh, direction, at least, to make it easier to consume and uh, stickier in the sense of uh, nicer, funny, visually appealing. Let's continue. Perhaps while checking this, can I ask about uh, multilingual fact-checking? I guess you've been working to a large extent with English texts, but also perhaps some texts in other languages. Are there particular issues that have to be considered when developing uh, systems in a, a multilingual context? Well, my opinion is that... Uh if you develop a good language chain, you can easily uh, switch between languages. You just uh, change the language-specific uh, modules uh, in your language chain that it's proven to work for a particular language. Uh, however, okay, for English is better because you have uh, a better resources. Uh, the models that or language uh, parts are better tuned. Uh, 
in some way you can do the translation to English. Sometimes uh, at the moment uh, translation from other languages to English is pretty good. Automatic translation, again, because for English you do have a large corpus uh, to train uh, even the translator. This is another way, just translate to English and go through this language chain in English. Thanks. So, in the last few minutes that we have, I'd like to look forward. Certainly, fact-checking and fake news is very much in focus at the moment. But how do we think things are going to look in five years' time, ten years' time? Is everything solved? Has the problem gone away? Is the problem a greater one? Is it a different problem? Uh, how do you see things evolving? Um, the, the, both how will the technology for automatic fact-checking develop and how might the, the problem of fake news change in its character in the years ahead? Is it going to be more personalised news that has to be uh, acted against? Uh, so perhaps if we can just take this uh, round the, uh, the group. So on the screen, you're closest to me. Ivan, do you have any... What are your views of how things are going to develop in the next years? I don't know what will happen really in five years, but uh, I think that uh, it's kind of important not to delete uh, so much, uh, let me say... Uh, Okay, we can improve the algorithms, they can get better, uh, but probably not going uh, too much uh, deleting and uh, harming this way the freedom of uh, speech. Uh, considering conspiracy theory, I think there's not so dangerous. They are kind of uh, provoke people uh, on critical thinking. They are critical to the reality, uh, to the, this mainstream theories. And, uh, okay, usually the conspiracy theory, theory quite often are based on kind of facts. Uh, and, uh, okay, this is a good exercise. We just should help the people with uh, providing the right information rather than to ban uh, them and uh, putting down in some way. Thanks. And uh, Paolo, can I turn to you next? How do you see things developing? So from the technical perspective, there are a bunch of things that we already touched today, like the multimodal for sure, the fact that we need to become much better at handling the delivery of these, how to interact. And um, personally, as I mentioned also in the talk, I think that from the technical side, there is a lot of people working on this now, pushing from different communities. So we will see in the next two to five years, a lot of tools uh, coming up and also delivering some of the functionalities that you guys mentioned, like uh, online uh, uh, fact-checking uh, with speech. I think that these things will come. But uh, as we also, I think, uh, discussed today, there are settings where this is going to be useful, like if you are moderating a debate uh, between politicians. So now there is an authority who is deciding, you know, you need to respond to this. And in this setting, it is going to be definitely useful. But in the bigger problem, especially involving social network and citizens online, I think that this is where the, the game is still very open and uh, uncertain, because it's, there are many more actors that must be involved and, uh, uh, and it's still not clear. And we will need some time, I believe, because the responsibilities of the content online who is responsible for what, who is responsible for taking action, is still a big topic beyond fact-checking in general. And uh, I think that this will take some time to get clear rules and clear rules. Thanks, Paolo. And uh, Sheila, your thoughts on this? Well, I'm not sure that I uh, agree with all of the things that have just been spoken about with the conspiration theories not being dangerous. Uh -huh. I would suggest uh, Googling what's the harm to get some good uh, feeling, 
associated uh, arguments for why people should change their minds. Yes. But where we're going in the future, I have a hope. And that is that we're going to get a lot of the young people engaged with some type of gamification of ch fact checking. Give them the tools and set them loose so that they can win points for, instead of shooting down this <laughs> and that, shooting down uh, wrong facts. Thanks for that. Uh, Jenny? Well, I think that the uh, AI technology will obviously uh, take off from here and there will be great opportunities, I think, uh, in that sense. But then uh, when it comes to the social development, maybe I think that is even more important because it's uh, also about, I mean, there's only so much that, that can be solved by technology also. Yeah. This is a, a social question of um, trying to curb polarization and create a good political climate and uh, also to educate the citizens so that we actually you know, have a sense of history and why are we here <laughs> and why has this uh, society become as it is uh, to be able to meet the information individually that we do online. So hopefully we will also advance in that direction. That's my hope. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, predicting the future is difficult. Yes. But I've been wrong before, so I can do it again. <laughs> uh, no, I agree with what uh, all the others said, but uh, it, it's a tricky landscape uh, we're yes. heading into. Uh, but, but I think we will learn both in terms of technology and technology development, but also in terms of how we as citizens and organizations learn how to deal with fake news and disinformation. But it will be a challenge. Uh, but I always come back to our own reactions when we meet rumors and how to act, and that's from a pamphlet from 1962 from the Swedish government trying to, it's what's named the, if war comes, so it, what to do with rumors during wartime. And it had three advice to ordinary citizens, and I think they're still valid. And the first one is, people talk so much. People are not always telling the truth. You don't have to share everything people say. I think that that's good advice still. Yes. That's good. So uh, we're reaching uh, the end of our time here. Uh, so it's been a, a fascinating morning. I think that there are certainly challenges ahead. Um, I think on the technological side, I think that there's uh, great work being done, but also a lot of work, probably more work ahead of us. Um, shortage of training data to help us build better models. Um, inevitably, I think the, the problem is going to change in character and we'll need to develop the methods to deal with these changes. But it's uh, good to know that there are steps being taken in these directions. Um, I particularly take the point about the explainable AI being important, the importance of being able to uh, motivate the decisions that the systems are taking and to communicate those uh, decisions to those who are using the results of the system. And I think it's also coming across the importance that this is not a technological problem on its own. It's something which is part of a much wider problem that's going to need input for many different disciplines with um, education, better regulation, as well as the inevitable uh, technological innovation that's needed uh, in the years ahead. So hopefully there'll be more uh, interdisciplinary discussions like the one that we're having today. And I'd just like to finish by thanking once again uh, the panelists and the speakers for taking part this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Ivan and Paolo. Uh, the flowers here will be virtual. I will send an e-card to you later on. But for the panelists, I would like to uh, share my appreciation on behalf of, the, of this event, uh, Chalmers University of Technology and Gothenburg University. So, um, should I help? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll hold Some this. help, please. <laughs> All right. So, let me do this. Um, this is tricky. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> so, thank you very much, uh, <laughs> Sheila. Oh. Yeah, Thank you this. for inviting me. Um, Yanni, Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much.
Thank you. And uh, uh, last but not least, Graham. Thank, Thank you, you much. very much. Thank you. And uh, just to round off with uh, maybe a personal view on this also, I think this is probably one of the biggest uh, challenges we're facing now. Uh, climate crisis is, of course, uh, the ultimate crisis, but it's hard to tackle the crisis without information. So maybe this is the most important thing in our uh, lifetime. And I think also we as researchers have an extra responsibility here to provide facts. And when engaging in social, social debate and political debate, make sure to distinguish between our role as researchers and our role as humans being involved in political discourse, for instance. And I think I can say from a personal point of view that has been lacking now a little bit in the COVID debate, for instance. All right, um, but not all is doom and gloom. I think we have challenges ahead, but we have met uh, technologi technological and social challenges before in our history, so we will survive this too. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you again. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>